And controversies over the destiny of former industrial schools and laundries have persisted. This includes just this year in 2018, the proposed development of the former Good Shepherd Convent in Cork into apartments, and the redevelopment of the former Magdalen Laundry at Sean McDermott Street in Dublin into a hotel and shopping center. Within the formal museum sector, the experience of institutional abuse remains nearly invisible, with only a few exceptions across the island. Some of us who are here in this room will remember the Irish Museums Association conference in March 2017 in Galway, and this took place on the very same day that the devastating news broke of a large number of remains of children that had been discovered at the site of a former mother and baby home in Chum, County Galway. This is another investigation which is ongoing, and details of, a, of plans for a forensic examination were announced only last week. And this is also a site which has yet to receive any kind of substantive formal commemoration. So we as a museum and heritage community are faced with a pressing dilemma. There are no nationwide structures or processes in place to scope or plan for the preservation and collection of these histories from a heritage perspective, particularly within local communities where such legacies are very deep and very painful. The need for coherent and considered policies and practices is further exacerbated by the aging of survivors and the ongoing threat to the survival of what material heritage still remains. So I hope today's panel will be an intervention and the beginning of a sustained conversation about our roles and responsibilities as a sector. How can we engage in initiatives such as the one that was held just last week at Boston College on the subject of transitional justice, recognition, truth-telling, and institutional abuse in Ireland? How might we begin to develop collection strategies that anticipate current and future audiences and researchers? How can we incorporate historical and contemporary narratives into both existing and new exhibitions? And what new means of interpretation and public engagement might be conceived? Today for this panel, we've gathered together three experts and asked them to reflect on these challenges, drawing from their own experience in collecting and exhibiting institutional pasts and making presentations that are explicitly uh, structured at informing future approaches. Each of them will be speaking for 10 minutes and will be followed by then questions that I'll put to them in discussion amongst the panel. And I'm very pleased to introduce all three of them to you now. First speaking will be Brian Crowley, whose collections curator at Kilmainham Jail in Dublin, a policy which is, or, sorry, a property rather, that's under the general management of the Office of Public Works. Brian is formerly curator of the Pierce Museum, where he led the re redevelopment there of its permanent exhibition, which opened for our 2016 centenary to great acclaim. Brian is curator at Kilmainham, which itself is currently the most visited institutional heritage site in the Republic of Ireland. And Brian's also the most recent chair of the Irish Museums Association. Dr. Megan Dennis is curator for Norfolk Museum Service, where her responsibilities include management of Gresson Hall Farm and Workhouse, including its collections management, volunteer teams, and outreach initiatives. She recently led the interpretations and collections redevelopment of their Workhouse exhibition. And this is a project she'll be speaking about today. Megan is also the Museums Association representative for the East of England. And finally, Dr. Alwyn Perdue is senior lecturer and director of the MA in Public History at Queen's University Belfast. Her research expertise is on the social and economic history of 19th and 20th century Ireland, with a focus on urban poverty, welfare, and public health. Alwyn was specialist historical advisor for Titanic Belfast and a member of the advisory group for the Ulster Museum's Irish History Exhibition. Alwyn's a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and a member of their Public History Pi Prize Panel and also international editor for the Public Historian Journal. So we'll begin today then with Brian. So, uh, so as Emily said, um, I look after the collection and exhibition in Kilmainham Jail, uh, which at various times was county jail for Dublin, uh, but principally famous as a, a cauldron of Irish uh, revolution, a republican shrine, and perhaps most surprisingly, uh, one of Ireland's um, most uh, popular uh, and busiest tourist attractions. Um, but I'm going to start back in uh, 1916 on Easter Monday morning, the 24th of April. Father Aloysius, a Capuchin priest, was on his way to the convent of Our Lady of Charity Refuge on Gloucester Street, now Sean McDermott Street, in Dublin city centre. This convent housed a notorious Magdalen Laundry and was home to generations of Irish women 
who were placed there because they were considered sexually transgressive, economically inconvenient, or both. It was to remain in operation until the 1990s. On his way, Father Aloysius noticed two figures on bicycles coming down the street from Rutland, now Parnell Street. He immediately identified one of them as uh, Patrick Pierce on his way to lead the 1916 Rising. The second man he later learned was Pierce's brother, William. And both of these men were later executed in Kilmainham Jail for their part in the Rising. And Father Aloysius and uh, a number of other Capuchin priests ministered to them and the other executed leaders before their executions. So, uh, unsurprisingly, for nearly a century, historical interest in this story has focused on the two Pierce brothers, off to fight in one of the great historical turning points of Irish history. Little or no attention has been paid to the women incarcerated in the Magdalen Laundry for whom Father Aloysius was about to say Mass. And in many ways, I think this moment encapsulates so much of, Ireland, of Irish society's relationship with its past. We have been fascinated, some might say obsessed, with the story of our revolutionary struggle for independence. This has often been at the expense of more troubling narratives in which those who did not conform to accepted norms within Irish society were brutally silenced, their story erased. Therefore, the decision in 1960 to form the Kilmainham Jail Restoration Society in order to preserve and restore Kilmainham Jail had nothing whatsoever to do with the building's history as the County Jail of Dublin between 1796 and 1910, nor the, had it anything to do with the estimated 100,000 ordinary criminal prisoners who passed through its doors during that time. It was purely the jail's association um, with the struggle for independence and in particular its use as the location for the executions of the leaders of the 1916 Rising, which motivated an extraordinary group of volunteers to save it from possible demolition. And then, of course, in addition to the dramatic events of 1916, the jail had played a pivotal role in nearly every part of the struggle for Irish independence, from the 1798 rebellion, Robert Emmett's rebellion in 1803, the Young Islanders in 1848, the Fenians in 1867, the Par Parnell and the Land League between 1881 and 82, the Invincibles in 1883, and then as a purely political prison, uh, the 1916 Rising. It was used again during the War of Independence and finally closed at the end of the Civil War uh, and finally closed in 1924. Um, sorry. Unsurprisingly, um, uh, with this very crowded narrative, it was very difficult to find space to talk about the experience of ordinary prisoners in Kilmainham Jail. Um, when they did appear uh, in those early years, it was generally in the context of the Great Famine of the 1840s. And their story was told to reinforce the museum's dominant narrative of, British, of the British government's misrule in Ireland and the necessity for successful revolutionary movements to fight for Irish independence. Those who were imprisoned for what were considered sexually transgressive crimes, such as prostitution or homosexuality, went unmentioned. Neither was there any real discussion of the more problematic prisoners in the jail's history, for example, those guilty of heinous acts such as murder and rape. However, in addition to the restoration of uh, the building, the Kilmainham Jail Restoration Society also gathered together one of the most important collections of material related to, our, to the Irish independence struggle. Many members of the Restoration Society were themselves veterans, veterans of that struggle and had a network of people, had access to a network of people who had significant collections of material. But most importantly, I think they were genuinely interested in collecting these items and valued them. And this was at the time, in contrast with the National Museum, who had initially been quite resistant to collecting objects related to the modern struggle for independence. An institutional focus within the museum on established taxonomies meant that there was no space for the unusual material thrown up by an often scrappy revolutionary movement. The fact that the National Museum now has such a rich 1916 collection was due to the efforts of an outsider, a former revolutionary and journalist, Nellie Gifford, rather than an initiative from within the museum. The collecting areas established by the Kilmainham Jail Restoration Society continues to be a big influence on what we collect today. The items in our collection are often deeply personal and emotive. 
They provide visitors to the museum with a complex insight into the often tragic lives of those who found themselves imprisoned in Kilmainham Jail as a result of their political beliefs and activities. And I'm just going to talk about just one item here, this box of shells, which uh, belonged to the daughter of Thomas McDonough, one of the leaders of the 1916 Rising, who was executed in the jail in 1916. The following year, she was in Skerries at the seaside with her mother, uh, Muriel, and they were playing together on the beach with these shells. Her mother went in for a swim, swam too far, got into difficulties and drowned. And Barbara McDonough and these shells were gathered up together um, uh, and taken away from the scene of this terrible tragedy. And for me, these are, in many ways, a very powerful reminder to our visitors that the 1916 Rising is not all about the GPO, the great struggle for independence. For a lot of people, the 1916 Rising was a very personal tragedy and its effects in terms of these personal tragedies were to continue for generations to come. Unfortunately, the Kilmainham Jail Restoration Society did not focus any particular effort at collecting material related to the ordinary prisoners uh, in the jail, though it should be said that there wasn't necessarily much material for them to collect. However, by the 1990s, a more holistic and inclusive approach to telling the story of Kilmainham Jail was developed when the current museum uh, was built and opened. And one entire floor of that new building was dedicated to telling the story of ordinary prisoners. However, in contrast with the rich and engaging material we have relating to political prisoners, we estimate that less than 2% of our collection uh, has a connection with the history of ordinary prisoners. And this material often lacks the richness and depth of the rest of the collection and offers little insight into individual lives. In most cases, the only evidence which survives about criminal prisoners is their entry in prison registers. Indeed, if they had not been arrested, they may well have, there may well be no record of their existence at all. Our necessary reliance on these records mean that their lives remain defined by the penal and judicial system which incarcerated them and sought to diminish their humanity. With only these brief, bureaucratic and biased records to draw from, it can be very difficult to avoid reducing individual prisoners to being simply a representative type. While there is an appetite among visitors to find out more about these ordinary prisoners, the scant details which survive about their lives means that it's often tempting to concentrate instead on the better known biographies of Ireland's revolutionary heroes. So, when it comes to looking about how museums might document the experience of individuals who are placed in Magdalen laundries, maybe mother and baby homes, children's homes, and industrial schools, perhaps the most useful lesson Kilmainham Jail can offer may, ironically, lie in its collection of material relating to political prisoners. This collection contains a large number of objects and mementos which were kept by people as a memorial of their, of their own experiences. The deep and nuanced stories we can tell about their lives stems from the very personal nature of these objects and the agency which their owners had in choosing how they wished to be remembered. The survival of this material in the public, re in the public realm was possible because somewhere like Kilmainham Jail Museum existed and it was able to demonstrate to the people who donated the material that the stories that was be the stories behind it and the material itself was important and valued. Therefore, the main priorities for museums uh, in relation to these other institutions should centre around the building of trust with the survivors, assuring them that, the, that museums wish to learn about their experiences and listening to how they want to be heard and represented. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, my name's Megan. Um, for the last five years, I've been working on a project called Voices from the Workhouse. Hopefully the screen will change, ah, excellent. Um, funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund, we've been exploring ways to collect, exhibit, and engage with the history of this workhouse. The project has forced us to engage with troubled pasts. Previously, these pasts have been invisible, unrecognized, misunderstood, and even censored. Today, I want to talk about how we developed strategies to collect, exhibit, and engage with these difficult histories, including experiences of rape, suicide, and illegitimacy within the institution. Key to these strategies was the recognition that these difficult pasts also have contemporary parallels that we cannot ignore. 
But we must also recognize that the collections also contain uplifting and surprising stories of positivity and empowerment within the institution, which also needed to be told in a careful balancing act. Ah. First, I want to talk about how we developed a strategy for collecting the institutional histories at Gresson Hall. And we started off by reviewing what we already had. And you can see some of the things that we already had on the screen. Um, we were surprised. We thought we didn't have workhouse collections, and actually we discovered that our workhouse collections were unrecognized and unrecorded within the collection, not uncollected. We uncovered a nationally significant collection of over 1,000 objects that related to Norfolk's workhouses. These were scattered within Norfolk Museum Service, so they weren't all held at Gresson Hall. Um, but what the review enabled us to do was to bring them together, to understand the strength of the collection and the stories that they could tell, and also the significance, not only to Norfolk, but also nationally, because I think nationally these collections are unrecognized as well. Secondly, we questioned what workhouse collections were. We widened our strategy to include buildings and archaeological items ex excavated on site. This meant thinking about how we were recording these items and how we were collecting them. We had a complete historical building survey carried out. We made full building analyses and worked with an academic partner to create 3D virtual models of the building at different stages of its development. We collected and analyzed archaeological finds on site, which had previously languished unaccessioned. With over 200 years of use as a place of welfare, we recognize that the physical changes in the material culture and architecture of the institution told their own stories of cultural and social change. We tackled questions of geographical, chronological, and typological limitations. We were not concerned with collecting on a national scale, and I think when we're trying to develop a strategy for collecting um, difficult institutional histories, we have to be very careful about, about this question of scale. Geographically, we located ourselves in Norfolk, but chronologically, we wanted to collect right up to and including contemporary welfare systems. We wanted to show the links between the past and the present. Typologically, we excluded archival material, preferring to work in partnership with the National Archives and the Norfolk Record Office, where all extant material relating to Gresson Hall was already deposited. And we found that our shift from a rural life museum in a workhouse to a museum that tells the nuanced histories of the institution in the context of rural, Norfolk's rural life has required several savage rewrites of our collecting policy. Secondly, I wanted to talk about how we developed our ex exhibition strategies. We started with a clear understanding of why these histories are being explored at this site. We wanted to avoid dark tourism with the use of troubled histories to sensationalize or consciously or unconsciously exhibit people's pain for others' enjoyment. Our approach was very studied and careful. We wanted to place these difficult episodes within their historical and contemporary contexts and make them approachable and understandable. We wanted to promote discussion in a safe space where differing views and attitudes could be encountered. Everything was meticulously researched. Museums are trusted spaces. There's no place for inaccuracies, vagaries, assumptions, or stereotypes. And that's another reason why we wanted to concentrate on the history of a, this single institution, because we didn't have the scope, the capacity to, to research um, as meticulously as we would have wanted to the history of the, the National Workhouse System. We worked with the National Archive and Norfolk Record Office to digitize, catalog, publish online, and explore all of the remaining workhouse records for Gresson Hall, and to research individual experiences in the institution, and to put those experiences into the broader context of those people's lives. So we not only researched in the workhouse archive evidence for um, people's experiences in the institution, but we also looked at what happened to them before they went into the workhouse and also when they left the workhouse. These were then used to create a palimpsest of different lived experiences of those who lived and worked in the workhouse. And this is a, a part of the project that's still ongoing. At the top of the screen, you can see those gray panels. They're part of a flexible um, display system that we created. Um, and we now have a library of these panels. And each one tells a different story about a different person who either lived or worked at some point in their lives in the workhouse. And, and we change those, we shift those um, to... to um, refresh and renew the displays. 
We carefully plotted themes and microhistories gallery by gallery to ensure a balanced approach. We aimed to enable visitors to understand the difficult histories in the context of the more mundane. And I would say, I don't know if it was lucky, but the difficult periods in the history of Gresson Hall as an institution were probably um, few and far between. So we had to balance using those um, difficult histories in a way that they didn't overpower what was, what was more normal within the institution. We wanted to give our visitors space to think and reflect and engage rather than be overwhelmed. We also worked with families and descendants, and you can see some of those um, in the small picture on the left-hand side of the screen. These are their stories, um, and working with families is not always easy, um, but it resulted in some powerful experience, both for the individuals involved, but also for the museum, and the creation of this amazing collaborative community who, who now feel that this is their museum, that they have ownership. The development of the exhibition took time and patience. Um, we had a strategy of failure, which sounds a bit strange. Um, we tried various approaches, we prototyped, we consulted, we developed things, and then we discarded them. Um, we didn't expect to get the exhibition of complex histories right first time. Um, we had to try and fail to find the right way forward. Sometimes it's moving, sometimes it's not. Ah, there we go. Um, Thirdly, I want to discuss our engagement strategy. We didn't only want to collect these histories and exhibit them, we wanted people to really engage with them. Um, and our museum now seeks to engage with contemporary issues and to stimulate discussion, and this is as a, as a result of the, of the project. Um, it's become a core part of our ethos. We want to um, have our visitors come and think about welfare today um, as a result of seeing our exhibition and visiting the museum and engaging with us. And one example you can see on the top of the screen is an exhibition of harrowing contemporary documentary photography by Jim Mortram, which records the effects of austerity and current welfare systems of people in our local market town. Um, we have purposely engaged with new partners, um, and you can see a, a, a number of logos on the left-hand side. Um, Institutions and welfare organizations that over time have perhaps replaced the workhouse. We actively wanted to make it part of our ethos that we would continue to support those individuals that 100 years ago the workhouse would have supported. So we're, we're actively seeking and working with partners that, that now work with those people today. Um, museum and archive sources are used at the heart of these engagements. Um, and you can see at the top of the screen um, a collection of spoon dolls, which were um, created by... Um, participants after examining workhouse census records, and we have one spoon doll for every inmate in the workhouse in 1861. Each spoon was created by someone today who 100 years ago would have been part of the workhouse community. We actively engage with creative professionals and communities exploring our collections and histories in new and inspirational ways, telling the story of the workhouse in a community and schools opera, as you can see on the top left-hand side, um, enabling creative writing like the fantastic poem Houses Divided by Kate Eggleston Wirtz that we have exhibited at the museum a year ago, and displaying varied and exciting work on site to a mainly family audience. None of this work would have been possible without an open and experimental strategy that proactively seeks to enable engagement with the past in a diverse range of ways and to promote the discussion of contemporary issues of welfare today. In conclusion, collecting, exhibiting, and engaging with troubled pasts at Gresson Hall would not have been possible if we'd been too afraid to try. We had to commit to tell the whole story and to not only select the most salacious, horrific, or safe episodes in the history of the institution. We had to put the troubled pasts into their historical contexts to enable real understanding. And it had to be a nibbling process, trying a little bit at a time until we found the right strategies for us. We admitted when we got it wrong and we tried to learn from our failures. We always tried to approach the challenge with honesty and integrity. Um, and a key to this was working and learning from other workhouse sites. In terms of strategy, we accepted that we cannot tell the whole story of the national workhouse system. 
I think rather there needs to be a nested series of strategies towards this. Individual sites, local, regional and national strategies all sitting within each other to ensure difficult institutional histories are collected, exhibited and used for engagement. Um, key, to, key to our challenge and, and the reason why I have put this slide up is um, balancing those troubled histories with a family-friendly site. We're a 60-acre site um, with a working farm, which was also a working farm in the workhouse period, um, very popular with school children. Um, and we found that actually, by not underestimating the capacity of children to really engage with these difficult histories, that was where the key was to that balance. At the end of the day, the only failure, I would say, is not to try to record these institutional histories. Thank you. On Monday the 22nd of October, just three weeks ago, uh, the Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison issued a national apology uh, to the survivors of institutional abuse in the Australian Parliament and committed his government to the establishment of a new museum to raise awareness and understanding of the impacts of child abuse. This led to some considerable debate as to whether a museum was in fact an appropriate space for such topics to be explored. So I want to look briefly now, just for a few minutes, at the, at the role that might be played by public history and particularly by museums in dealing with troubled pasts and with the legacy of violence and abuse. And to ask whether museums should and can effectively address such problems and difficult topics. Here in Northern Ireland, we've had our share of difficult pasts Past that still for many live on into the present. Things that have happened in the past have caused deep wounds, some of which are clearly visible to all and others which are invisible but nonetheless real for that. Much of the troubled history with which this region has sadly been associated is all too well known. For 30 years, this part of the country has been torn apart by violence, was tragically affected many people of my generation and that of my parents. For many of us, thankfully, that is now very much in the past. Um, last year, I realized to my shock that my undergrad students for the first time were born after the, uh, the peace process had begun, which really made me realize just to what an extent for the new generation coming through, this still is very much part of history uh, rather than something they've lived through, which is a good thing. Some, however, do continue to carry the scars with them through bereavement, physical injury, or emotional trauma. Indeed, the legacy of that violence carries on in other ways as well. Earlier this year, as we approached the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, um, the end of the conflict, the, the Guardian reported the shocking statistic that more people have taken their own lives in Northern Ireland since the Good Friday Agreement than were killed in political violence during the Troubles. But this region, along with the rest of Ireland, is also struggling to come to terms with another difficult and troubled past that has not been so visible to the world at large. As a series of inquiries and reports that Emily referred to earlier have shown, the abuse of children, young people and women has gone on in state and church-run care homes across the country over generations and has caused significant trauma and left scars on our society. The question that faces us then as, as public historians, museum professionals, academics, practitioners is what do we do with this? What do we do with this knowledge? How do we deal with past trauma, with violence and abuse? And more specifically, what role do cultural institutions such as museums have in dealing with trauma? Let me go back to the troubles. Um, earlier on this year, on the 20th anniversary of the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, the Ulster Museum here in Belfast took a very brave step in launching its new, much anticipated gallery to the Troubles, the Troubles and Beyond. As many of you will be aware, this was designed to replace an older, much criticised representation of the Northern Ireland Troubles 
where the old gallery had been based solely on enlarged black and white images with minimal text, um, utterly ineffective in its desire not to offend. The new gallery is collection-based, incorporating artifacts from everyday life during that period, from the conflict itself, and also artistic responses to the Troubles. Importantly, it also involves continued work with local communities to gather oral history, to collect and record a wide range of objects and the stories connected to them. Where the old gallery was monochromatic and two-dimensional, the new one is dynamic, offering opportunities for people to respond and contribute their own stories, so constantly changing as people respond to it, adding layers of meaning and real depth of understanding through their own first-hand accounts, not just of the conflict, but of the reality of living on a day-to-day -day basis. I visited the new gallery just the day after it had been officially launched, um, and there were a large number of people there to see it. Uh, from the accents around me, I got the impression that there were some international visits, visitors, but the majority of those that were there that day were local to Northern Ireland. I was particularly struck by an enlarged photograph that was up on one of the big walls, um, a huge photograph of families being evacuated from their burned out homes uh, during the early years of the conflict. I stood looking at the photograph, just taking it all in and thinking, you know, just how different from my own experience it was. Um, and I stood looking at it for a while and there was a man standing beside me, a guy probably in his mid sixties, I would say, and he was just standing looking at it as well. And he just suddenly started to talk. Um, I remember this so well, he said. And he just went on to tell me about his memory of his family being burnt out of their home in exactly this way, about the family gathering up what possessions they had, abandoning their home to the flames, losing everything that they'd known. And as he spoke, it just struck me how different our experiences were. Um, his, with that, behind him, mine very limited experience growing up in, in the suburban east of the city. We just seemed to be worlds apart. But the conversation moved on and we talked about, you know, about the troubles and our memories of Belfast during the, the 1980s, about being searched as you went into shops. And suddenly from this very, very different perspective that each of us had, we came together into this shared moment um, and shared ground. And to me, in many ways, that is the success of that gallery, that it does bring people from all backgrounds and perspectives to this shared ground. And that made me think about the potential of museums. Um, and it brought an interesting slant to discussions I've been having with, with a range of people about whether now might be the time to um, develop a new museum to the Troubles and to the peace process. The question that comes up again and again however, and I think it's pertinent to our topic today, is should we remember? And if so, how should we remember? Is history not part of the problem? The past being a cause of so much division and used in ways that continue to divide us. Many of us who live through the troubles certainly prefer not to, to remember it. Um, and today, 20 years on, as we enjoy Belfast, hipster coffee scene, or it's Christmas market, um, it does seem like another world. Um, forgetting the past is easy, something probably many of us would prefer to do. Um, my new acquaintance at the photograph uh, also agreed with that. He st stood looking at the, the photograph and he said, you know, I'm not sure if this is a good thing, revisiting all this stuff. Wouldn't it be better just to leave these things in the past and move on? And similar objections and similar questions have been raised with regard to the role that museums might play in dealing with equally traumatic, though perhaps more personal causes of trauma, that of institutional abuse. Is that a subject for museums? Some responses range from, wouldn't this all be too painful, to, well, it's not exactly a great day out for the kids. What would be the purpose of such a museum, such an exhibition? Is it ethical? Is the museum an appropriate place in which to exhibit trauma? Does this not cause more harm than good? Is there not a danger as well that it will lead to commodification of suffering, something to be put on display for other people's entertainment? Yes, it might be. There are all sorts of dangers in curating exhibitions dealing with suffering in the past, particularly when those sufferings are still raw 
and still very real. Curators face a huge challenge in dealing with sensitively with the pain of survivors in collecting their stories in ways that gives them voice, respects the right to privacy, and restores their dignity. But I would also say that despite the dangers, there is an imperative on public historians to deal with these difficult pasts. Something that has actually been explored in many ways around the world, increasingly the potential and the power of museums to enable personal and social change, to confront difficult pasts and to act in ways that heal and build society is being recognized. And museums and public history and cultural institutions more generally are used as an important vehicle for transformative and restorative justice. In this, the new gallery at the Ulster Museum is a welcome addition to the growing number of exhibitions and memorial museums that are emerging globally in response to conflict. It has been seen, therefore, that if dealt with carefully and sensitively, institutions such as these can effectively exhibit painful pasts and can be approached in ways that seek to bring about healing. I would argue, therefore, that the, the public history institutions and the public history of institutional abuse can be dealt with effectively and needs to be dealt with in order to give a voice to those who were the powerless and the abused. We're beginning to see some moves in that direction here in Ireland, largely through organisations such as the Justice for Magdalene's Research or the Oral History Research based at UCD. But as is the case with the idea of a troubled museum and particularly plans for the creation of a centre for reconciliation at the former Maze Long Cash site, there does appear to be a lack of political will to drive this forward coherently. And initiatives are led by interested individuals rather than a coherent response from either the state, the church, or the world of cultural institutions. These are difficult topics, and remembering can be painful, but forgetting is a very dangerous thing. In the case of Northern Ireland's troubled past, we can very quickly forget where we've come from. We take our peace for granted. And in today's society, as our daily dose of news here and around the world uh, informs us, that forgetting seems to be allowing society to drift into very dangerous waters. There is therefore an ethical and a moral imperative on historians to fully engage in the public sphere, to curate thoughtful and sensitive installations that not just memorialize and give voice to victims that helps us and other societies to understand the processes that we've been through and the paths that society can take to redressing wrongs or finding peaceful solutions. I'm gonna finish with the words that an elderly man who visited the District 6 Museum in Cape Town, South Africa, uh, just words that where he found for the first time the, the ability to confront and deal with his own troubled past. And his words were, and who would have thought a museum could be such a place? Thanks very much to Brian and Alwyn and Megan for, I think, three really thoughtful and awful powerful presentations. As we've been talking about, the efforts to collect and interpret Magdalene and institutional histories is really very much at a nascent stage here on this island. Um, but I think all of our presentations demonstrated today the potential, I think, of, of, of thinking, of vision that might help engage with these processes, which again are very raw and are which are evolving even as we speak. Um, some of the themes that I think folks uh, sort of shared in terms of their presentation. First of all, I think everyone was talking about institutions that themselves have undergone processes of, of transition, which maybe haven't started from the place with which they're now at. And I think there's a lot for us to learn in terms of what's already um, been worked through and tried, and, and that Megan brought up the issue of sort of failure and, and, and having this kind of confidence to try things that might not work the first time, but to experiment and, and to go forward, no, no matter if it does seem difficult. And again, this is a very contentious area. Um, folks mentioned also, also the importance of accuracy of research. I think many of the current um, issues around Magdalene and institutional abuse have been focused on, you know, textual documentation, and this has been the emphasis so far with oral histories now kind of becoming a more dominant aspect as well. And the question of scale, whether we should be looking at local histories, national histories, where to divide our attention also. 
Um, one of the things Megan brought up that I think is really powerful as well is this idea of continuity between historical and contemporary experiences. Obviously, the, the kinds of um, experiences that we're talking about today, institutional abuse, you know, these, these are not issues which are confined to the distant past. They're very much part of the systems with which we're living with today. And this can be a difficult position for a museum to take to try and engage with these kinds of, of concerns. Not something that we see actually very often museums in Ireland or in the north of Ireland um, doing particularly effectively or if they've really struggled with it as well. Um, so I think many of the things that are happening at Gresson Hall actually are, are really enlightening in that context. Avoiding also the dark tourism and spectacular approach. I mentioned the half million memorial that failed in Parnell Square. And again, I think some of the resistance to that public monument was this idea that it was too soon, that it was turning this experience into something which uh, certainly survivors and advocacy groups were not yet ready to place it within a commemorative frame. And I think that's a perspective that we have to hear as well as we go through all of this. So those are just some of my initial kind of thoughts and feedbacks. And I just wanted for the last kind of 15 minutes for if we could have a bit of a conversation, I might ask some of our speakers some questions arising from their presentation, again, with this idea of, of trying to kind of start to think through and, and talk about some of the approaches that might be developed. Um, I mentioned the, um, the fact that so much of what's been generated so far is textual, and I think Brian brought up, brought up very evocatively how powerful the material culture can be, which again is something that we're kind of missing so far in terms of these histories, and, and Megan mentioned it as well in Gresson Hall. I wonder if you might expand a little bit, um, and of course the, the, the Troubles exhibition, the original Troubles exhibition, that was one of its deep flaws, was its lack of artifactual material which could really connect to people in emotional and profound ways, and you know, it was a very, if, if anyone remembers it. And certainly go see the, the new exhibition this evening at the Ulster Museum, but it was lots of, lots of text panels essentially. So if you might sort of expand on what you think the capacity is for objects to tell these sorts of stories, and also maybe a little bit about what might we do in terms of beginning these processes of collecting materials from, you know, again, these are folks often who are, who are living with these legacies and memories. Um, well, I suppose in, just in terms of the collection thing, what, what's interesting in Kilmainham is you go from, as I was saying, these incredibly rich uh, collections relating to the political history of the building. Um, and before we were speaking with myself and Hall, we were talking about just how skilled, um, I don't know if it's a, a feature of Irish Republicans, but they're actually really nuanced in terms of how they collected and what they collected, and, and often in a much more, I said, more nuanced ways than the professionals at the time. Um, but then when you look at the experience of the ordinary prisoners, essentially the reason they're in prison is uh, due to a material poverty. Um, so one of the few things that we do have is we have a box made in 1842 by a man who was being transported to Australia. And uh, it's just a small wooden box that he built to bring his possessions. And we did an exhibition a, few year, well, a good few years ago about unusual objects or objects with stories in our, in our museum. And I had this group of children, and they're actually from a very socially deprived area of Dublin, but one of the things that they found very difficult to imagine was that material poverty, because it's not a feature of modern poverty today. Um, but as I said, it's just, you just end up endlessly defining them by the fact that they were in prison and how they're described by an institution which essentially seeks to diminish their humanity, who sees them as defective people, that they are damaged people who are coming to this institution to be remade. Um, so it's, it's a, you know, they're stripped of their name, they're stripped of their personalities, and I was kind of interested that you were able to follow the lives of, of your prisoners afterwards. So this year we, did a, we were doing a tours of the Museum for Heritage Week, and we have a re register on loan, and I researched just a random woman in there. So she appears, the great thing now is you can search these, but she appears about 50 times, mostly for assault, prostitution, fighting, and she appears and then she disappears and you don't know you know, what happens before and you get these glimpses of a chaotic life but again it's just mm. it's always this lack mm. yeah i think it's it's very interesting and i think um for us at gresson hall some of the most powerful stories came from the objects um very briefly tell you um the story of um an object in our collection a first world war medal that was found underneath the floorboards in the casuals ward of the workhouse um, and had come into the collection in 1977 when the museum was being created. And I should, I should say that there's kind of this 
long continuity from 1777 when the building was, was built right the way through to 1975 when it became a, a museum, it had always been a place of welfare. So from a house of industry to a union workhouse to a poor law institution to a um, county care home for the elderly. And we're still operating as an old people's home the day there was kind of a crossover. The old people, old residents were moved out and the museum staff moved in. So that meant we, we um, had a wealth of found objects within the building, and some of them dating right back to the House of Industry period. So that, that was amazing and, and might not be an opportunity that other institutions would have. But this medal was discovered underneath the floorboards and, and was accessioned into the collection, but no one had ever done any research on it. And um, in brief, we decided to do the research. Um, and discovered that it belonged to a gentleman called Herbert Norton. And, and with his name from the medal, we were able to do exactly that, create the microhistory of his life. And we found out that he had been in, in the workhouse when he was a boy, um, and that he had been trained to be a valet, um, and he'd gone off, and he'd then served during the First World War. And after the First World War, he'd um, developed epilepsy. He'd been involved in a shell dump explosion, developed this epilepsy, um, and through using all kinds of sources, um, historical and newspaper reports, that kind of stuff, we then um, were able to unpick the tragic end to his story and, and, and how the medal came to be in the workhouse because Herbert um, went into a spiral of decline. He was um, forced out of his job after he had an epileptic fit. Um, couldn't support his family and had got to the point where he felt he wanted to return to the workhouse. The workhouse for him was a place of sanctuary. And so he came and he requested to be allowed to stay. Um, he was allowed to stay for one night, but because he was on, in receipt of out, out relief, he wasn't allowed to stay longer than that. And he was housed in the casuals ward, which is when we think he must have slipped the medal, which we think he probably wore on a chain around his neck between the floorboards. Um, and when he left, unfortunately, he, um, he never made it back. He committed suicide. He wasn't able to um, return to the workhouse where, where he felt safe and where he'd grown up and, and that had given him a community. And because that was denied to him, he, he, um, yeah, he, had, he felt he had no other option. And obviously an amazing emotional story for us, but a really important one because we tend to think of these institutions as places um, of terror. And actually for some they weren't. They were a safety net. They were a place that... Um, could provide, could provide a family for, for people who didn't have one elsewhere. Um, and that's a 20th century story, obviously, and, and involved us working with descendants, but really demonstrates if you can find those objects and you can find the stories and unpick them, then the power is all there. Um, as I said, we were very lucky to have a, a great wealth of collections that just stayed in the building. Um, we also received quite a lot of objects from staff and guardians who ran the workhouse, who had collected things during their working life. And, and, and those have been, and still continue to come in, so photographs and um, wooden platters and all sorts, all sorts of things that staff and guardians had collected. But I don't think we have anything that has been donated by a inmate, mm. and that, that says a lot because the objects that have been retained have been selected by those who were in power. And that's, that's another yeah. issue. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very much at the, the heart of my research at the minute. In terms of welfare, poverty, it's the people who are in positions of power who leave the letters, who leave the diaries, you have obituaries written about them, the poor don't have that. Um, and the same, the actual physical objects associated with, with poverty, with welfare, um, with institutions, tends not to reflect those who used them, but those who perhaps administered them. And I guess that's where this very, um, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, trying to build up the research um, using institutional records where possible, um, and very much sometimes detailed research and very little to go with to try and build up that picture. Um, the other thing we've found very successful has been to actually engage wider communities in this research, so for example, bringing um, groups of young people to, to Queen's University to talk about the workhouse, about welfare issues in the early, 19, early 20th century, and then send them back to their communities to, to talk to families and elderly relatives about what they're learning and they're researching. And it's incredible just what kind of objects and um, artifacts 
that come from that, but then they mm. in themselves generate more stories. So it's very much an iterative, iterative pro process that can be very rewarding for everybody involved. But it's just one of those ways to deal with that problem. Yeah, we're really excited at the moment to be um, involved in a project that's looking at um, the records that exist from um, inmates within the National mm -hmm. Archives um, collection, the Pauper Letters project, which is being run from, from Leicester, which um, is looking at those very ephemeral and very few um, traces of, of agency where, where paupers have, have attempted to engage with the system, and that's been really eye-opener for us. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, those kinds of process-based collections approaches are really interesting. Mm. I'm thinking even of a sort of an earlier generation of the UCD, the, the folklore collection, the school survey, for example, where young people went and, you know, across the country, there was this uh, joined up initiative for young people to interview their grandparents about what they knew around the famine and around all other kinds of events in Irish history. And today, those kind of copy books, which are still in the collection of the folklore archive, are themselves an object that people come and visit, not only for their information, but they're now part of the experience of the people who actually wrote them and conducted them. So it can have that sort of longevity of presence, which is a really interesting, really interesting. aspect. One of the things that we've kept circling around, I think, at this conference in, in lots of sessions and in, in lots of different ways are the issue of the live issue of politics within the space of the museum. And this, of course, is a dimension of the topic we're talking about today because, many, again, many of the, the concerns we're looking at are still in issues of, of live redress and justice. So that was a question I wanted to ask our panelists as well, is how can museums deal with this or in what ways can they approach this because this is inevitably going to be part of the story that we're trying to um, collect and interpret around issues of institutional abuse. Um, is it ethically possible for, for a museum to distance itself from this? And I just thought if you might have a few reflections on that, and a few of you have already brought it up in your presentations. Well, I would say, um, I'd say that museums do have a responsibility to deal with, with issues, but there's a very, very fine balance between the, the various roles that, that museums play um, and while engaging with difficult and contemporary issues is one aspect of that, it's not all of it. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that's where programming comes in, um, to, to activities of, uh, that, that are built around perhaps exhibitions, a uh, series of lectures, um, debates, that there are spaces in which those discussions can take place that aren't necessarily part of the, the exhibition itself in some ways. Mm -hmm. I also would say that there's a lot of ways in which um, contemporary issues can be alluded to without necessarily being the central focus of an exhibition as well. And I think that mm. can be very, very successful and you mm. probably... Yeah, I think that's, agree, that's yeah. the most powerful. So the, the documentary photography that, that um, we exhibited and we collected from Jim Mortram from, from our local market town, um, we displayed together with historical photography. And um, that was really enlightening and enabling and, and allowed us to see that continuation and, and that link in a very in a very kind of hopefully light touch way you know not too heavy-handed but um really powerful mm. and i suppose in terms of kilmainham like in some ways prisoners are one of the most socially excluded groups within society um and there often isn't a space for them for their contemporary story to be told so like we are looking in the new year, we're doing an exhibition um, in conjunction with UCD, looking at kind of mental health in Irish prisons uh, since the 1960s. Um, but, you know, for many years as well, we were a venue for prisoner art exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, and they were, I remember them, they were really powerful events in terms of the families of prisoners who, in many cases, had been, you know, equally as traumatized by um, the experience of imprisonment. And this event, particularly the opening event, it was kind of a one kind of positive day for people who hadn't had many positive days um, mm -hmm. in their recent history. Um, but the other thing to bear in mind as well is that occasionally um, when we shift our focus from historical prisoners to contemporary prisoners, it's very interesting to see how kind of sometimes the media can be very sympathetic about historical prisoners and mm -hmm. very... Um, very critical about uh, mm -hmm. contemporary issues, mm -hmm. um, and there was a, a, it's a few years ago, but like a, a kind of tabloid newspaper got wind of a kind of a prisoner who had been involved in a sensational murder case, and they got wind of which of his pictures was on display, and that became the focus, and it was kind of government money being spent on 
on um, uh, an exhibition about this notorious figure. Um, and, and again, that kind of disconnect is really interesting. And that's, I suppose, one of the things I was trying to get across, particularly in relation to Khamenei's history. There's a tendency to see the experience of those poor prisoners in the 19th century as kind of a British issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's been a lack maybe of acceptance of Irish society's complicity mm. with the jail, but also in the wider sense with those institutions as well, that society was in many ways fully complicit. And we call them hidden histories, but I don't know how hidden they were. Mm -hmm. Just as one final question then, and this is, you know, I think really driving much of what we're, we've been talking about, and Alwyn mentioned it as well, but where does the responsibility lie to progress these initiatives? There's, a, as I think Alwyn has rightly observed, a lack of political will, but where is the push going to come from? Should it be from ourselves? Is it, are we leaving it to the sort of advocacy groups? Just briefly, you might sort of say where you think this should be located. Well, I'd say very briefly, I don't think we should be leaving it to the politicians mm -hmm. um, for obvious reasons. Uh, I think that there is, where there is interested groups and where there are museums and organisations that can drive something forward themselves, that's where it should be going from. Um, I think museums have a really important, maybe kind of leadership role to play. Um, and at the conference in Boston um, last week, it was announced that the National Museum are actually involved in collecting uh, a Magdalen laundry, um, which I think is really important to look at it in that national scale. But I also think in terms of our museum community, you know, I, I go to lots of local museums and, you know, you always know there's going to be the section on the local industry. But one of the things maybe we have to look at in local museums is about those institutions. And if you look at towns like Balanso, for example, mm -hmm. where the psychiatric hospital is essentially the main economic driver within the town. And again, there's this kind of complicity of you know, when you see how important it was to the town, there's, you sense at a certain point there's no, it's in nobody's interest for anybody to get any better or to be released from this. Mm. So, you know, it's perpetuated. So mm. I think local museums need to be a bit braver as well and kind of confront uncomfortable histories, mm. uh, uncomfortable local histories. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think it, need, it needs to come from that local. Um, and then, as I was saying in my, in my presentation, that kind of nesting and building to something that, that's, that's more regional and national, and that's, that's the way to, to start, where, where the interest is, where, where, where there's all, already that will to, to look at it and to, um, to really engage with those difficult pasts. Mm. Well, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, I just wanted to conclude by saying that for those folks who might be interested in continuing uh, this conversation, um, I'm pleased to announce we're going to be having a follow-on event uh, next spring that's going to be taking place at UCD, uh, sponsored by the Humanities Institute of Ireland under its research strand, a media encounter and witness troubling pasts. And we're really planning for both a series of published conference proceedings and also a set of recommendations and something that's usable as well for both museums and advocacy groups um, to be able to utilize to progress some of these initiatives. Um, and it just remains for me then to thank our three speakers, Alwyn and Brian and Megan, for sharing so generously of their experiences and their knowledge and their insights into this topic. And also to thank you, the audience, for uh, at the end of a long day, um, your patience and your interest and your attention. So thank you very much. Thank you.